Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis. In this video, we are going to look at the total synthesis of Daphne Papitone A. This video is going to be a little different than usual, as we are going to look at three different syntheses of this target, all of which were published within weeks of each other. The first synthesis that we will look at was published by the group of Bastien Ney in Chemical Science, while the second paper, also published in Chemical Science, comes from the Stoltz group. Finally, we will look at a synthesis from the groups of Huelan Li and Xie Gong Shi, which was published in Orglet. Daphne Papitone A was first isolated in 2022 from Daphne Papyracea by Dai and Zhao et al. Preliminary biological studies have shown that it exhibits inhibitory activity against avid glycosidase, suggesting that it may be useful in the treatment of diabetes. But more interestingly for chemists, it has an unprecedented 5654 tetracyclic skeleton, making it a challenging target for total synthesis. In particular, the cyclobutane moiety of this skeleton is a challenging ring to construct, as it contains three quaternary carbons, which form a network of five contiguous stereocenters. To construct this polycyclic ring system, all three groups utilize a strategy involving a passing can reaction, together with a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition. The selectivity required to construct the stereocenters would ultimately derive from the use of chiral pool starting materials. So let's start with our first synthesis, which comes from the Ney group. This synthesis starts with the epoxidation of R carvone using hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. The peroxide nucleophile undergoes conjugate addition into the enone system, and the enolate that is formed then undergoes intramolecular attack, eliminating hydroxide and forming the epoxide in a 94% yield. This was then subject to an eschen moser tanabi fragmentation. The reaction starts with the condensation of the ketone with tosyl hydrazide, forming a hydrazone. The reaction is triggered by the protonation of the epoxide, which first opens to give an alcohol intermediate. This intermediate then eliminates tosic acid and nitrogen gas, inducing the cleavage of a carbon-carbon bond, forming an alkyne and an aldehyde in a 43% yield. With this aldehyde in place, it set the stage for the installation of the allene required for the passing canned reaction. This was done by reacting 2-butynyl bromide with indium metal, forming an organo-indium intermediate. This attacks the aldehyde from the 3 position to form the target allene in a 95% yield with a 1 to 1.5 dr. They also carried this reaction out diastereoselectively using 2-butynyl pinnacle borane and a chiral phosphoric acid catalyst. This chiral catalyst forms hydrogen bonds to both reactants and favours the addition to only one face of the aldehyde. Using this methodology, they prepared both diastereomers with DRs of greater than 95 to 5. In the next step, the alcohol formed by this addition was then protected as a TBS group. This was done using TBS chloride in DMF, which acts as both a solvent and a catalyst. The oxygen first attacks the TBS chloride forming a more reactive silating agent, which is then attacked by the hydroxyl group. The imidazole present in the reaction acts as a base to abstract a proton and form the protected intermediate in a 94% yield. Taking this forward, they then carried out an allenic pos and canned reaction. In this reaction, rhodium carbonyl chloride first coordinates to the alkyne and the distal end of the allene. An oxidative addition then occurs, forming two carbon bonds to the rhodium and a new carbon-carbon bond between the carbon of the allene and the alkyne. The addition of another molecule of carbon monoxide to the rhodium drives a migratory insertion, forming another carbon-carbon bond, this time with one of the carbon monoxide ligands. The reaction is completed with a reductive elimination that regenerates the rhodium catalyst and forms the target 5-membered enone in a 75% yield. The choice of catalyst is critical to the success of this reaction as allenes can react with both proximal and distal ends. Rhodium-1 catalysts have previously been shown to be very regioselective and preferentially react with the distal end of the allene. These reactions are typically carried out using a balloon of carbon monoxide gas, which presents quite a health hazard in the lab. These researchers, however, use Screedstrup's co system to safely generate carbon monoxide in situ. This is a sealed system comprising of two reaction chambers, connected by a small glass tube. The carbon monoxide 
is generated in chamber A and then flows in to chamber B, which contains the rhodium catalyst to which the substrate is added via a syringe pump injection through the PTFE seal. The carbon monoxide is generated by the reaction of 9 methylfluorine carbonyl chloride with palladium cod chloride. Tri terbutyl phosphonium hexafluoroborate and methyl dicyclohexylamine are also present in the reaction mixture. This forms tri terbutyl phosphine, which acts as a ligand for the palladium, which undergoes oxidative insertion into the acyl chloride. Beta hydride elimination from this complex generates the desired carbon monoxide, and a reductive elimination regenerates the palladium catalyst. With the bicyclic system now complete, they could then deprotect the TBS group. This was done using HCl for the racemic mixture, but they found that these conditions caused some epimerization in the stereochemically pure samples, so instead they used TBAF. The deprotection of the compound with S stereochemistry as a hydroxyl group generated the reported structure of diarthroncia C, while its R epimer produced Daphnen Salata W. The NMR data of diarthroncia C was initially recorded in deuterated chloroform, however this showed some discrepancies with the data previously reported for this structure. They then obtained NMR data using deuterated DMSO, which was the solvent used to characterise Daphnen Salata W. They found that these data were in much better agreement, and they concluded that the originally reported structure of diarthroncia C has incorrect stereochemistry, and that the compound that was originally isolated is actually the same as Daphnen Salata W. Taking the racemic mixture forward, the deprotection was carried out in an 80% yield using HCl, and the newly revealed hydroxyl group was oxidized using desmartin periodinate. This is attacked by the hydroxyl group, eliminating an equivalent of acetate that then acts as a base to deprotonate the carbon bearing the oxygen group, oxidizing it to a ketone, and eliminating an iodinated byproduct. This formed the natural product oleodaphnone in a 63% yield, and its structure was proven using X ray crystallography. The crystal structure showed an equimolar distribution of two conformers, one of which has the isopropenyl group in the pseudo axial orientation. In this conformation, there is a very short distance between the two double bonds that are required to react together to form the target cyclobutane ring. This data suggested that it should be quite easy to form this cyclobutane ring using this strategy. To do this, they irradiated a solution of oleodaphnone in DCM at 370 nanometers for 56 hours and this gave the target compound in a 73% yield. They suggest that this cycloaddition may be biomimetic and that this reaction could occur in the Daphne papyracea plant under the influence of natural sunlight. With the carbon skeleton now complete, they turned their attention to installing the hydroxyl group. This required the radioselective oxidation of the gamma position of the enone, which proved to be quite a challenging task. After extensive screening, they found that this could be done using chromium trioxide in DCM with acetic acid. This protonates the chromium trioxide, allowing it to abstract a hydrogen radical. This forms a radical intermediate that is stabilised by conjugation to the double bond. It is this stabilisation that likely drives the radioselectivity of the reaction. This radical intermediate can then react with another equivalent of chromium trioxide, forming the target carbon-oxygen bond, and further oxidation yields a ketone with a 62% yield. Taking this forward, all that remained was to selectively reduce this ketone to yield Daphne Papitone A. The initial studies used loose reduction conditions of sodium borohydride and cerium trichloride. However, this primarily produced a dihydroxy product, resulting from overreduction. They discovered that simply adding solid sodium borohydride to a solution of the compound in methanol yielded Daphne Papitone A in a 73% yield. This is unexpectedly selective as there are three possible carbonyls that sodium borohydride could react with. They attribute the reduced selectivity to the fact that cyclohexanones react faster with borohydride than cyclopentanones, and that the steric hindrance provided by the cage-like structure favours an axial approach of sodium borohydride, granting its stereoselectivity. So now, let's move forward and look at the Stolz synthesis. The first steps of their strategy were the same as the Ney synthesis, with the use of r carvone to generate an ene aline intermediate. Unlike the Ney group, who chose to oxidize this position later in the synthesis, the Stoltz group oxidized it early using DMP to produce the target ketone in a 65% yield. With this in hand, they then set about forming the cyclobutane ring. They found 
that this compound was unreactive under photocycloaddition conditions. However, the reaction could be carried out using a thermally promoted cycloaddition. While it is possible that the allene could react from both the proximal and distal side, they found that only the proximal side reacted. They attribute this selectivity to the stability of the intermediate formed after the first radical addition. They suggest that the reaction proceeds in a stepwise manner, with a diradical being formed upon heating. The vinyl radical first attacks to form a seven-membered ring, leaving a resonance-stabilized allyl radical that then recombines to form the four-membered ring. This formed the product in a 67% yield, with a 1 to 1.6 diastereomeric ratio. Taking one of these diastereomers forward, they then carried out a Poisson can reaction. Unlike the allenic Poisson can reaction used by the Ney group, this reaction, which features an alkene reacting with an alkyne, does not present any issues with selectivity, and therefore they were able to use the more common dicobalt octocarbonyl catalyst. This reaction formed two products with a 3.3 to 1 ratio. One of these products was the expected target compound with the cyclobutane intact, while the other was formed from a rearrangement reaction occurring after the enone had been formed. They hypothesized that this reactivity could arise from the enolization of the carbonyl, followed by a sigmotropic rearrangement. To test this hypothesis, they reacted the target product with DBU, which deprotonates the alpha position to form an enolate. They found that this enolate undergoes a 1,5 sigmotropic rearrangement to form the same byproduct as was seen in the Poisson Canned reaction in a quantitative yield. They used this information to optimize the reaction conditions for the Poisson Canned reaction, as the metal catalyst is able to promote this enolization. To minimize the concentration of free catalyst in solution, they conducted the reaction under dilute conditions at only 0.01 molarity and added the cobalt catalyst portion-wise to favor its desired reactivity without the undesired enolization. So with the carbon skeleton complete, they then proceeded to tackle the problem of the allylic oxidation. After initially attempting to directly install the hydroxyl group, they instead settled on a strategy of over-oxidation to a ketone and then reducing it to the target alcohol. To carry out this oxidation, they used manganese 3-acetate and tert-butyl hydrogen peroxide. The tert-butyl peroxide first abstracts a hydrogen radical from the allylic position and the carbon radical then reacts with a manganese complex bearing a peroxide ligand to form the target carbon-oxygen bond. This manganese peroxide complex is proposed to arise from the reaction of tert-butyl hydrogen peroxide with manganese 3-oxide. The oxidized intermediate then reacts further with either the hydrolysis of the peroxide to give a hydroxyl group or further oxidation to form a ketone. These three products were all obtained from the reaction with a 29% yield of the peroxide species, a 24% yield of 6 epi daphne papitone A with the undesired stereochemistry at the allylic position and a 22% yield of the target ketone. Attempts to invert the stereochemistry of the hydroxyl group on 6 epi daphne papitone A were unsuccessful and instead resulted in an intramolecular cyclization reaction. Abandoning this strategy, they instead pursued the reduction of the ketone using a loose reduction which utilizes cerium trichloride and sodium borohydride. This was successful in selectively reducing the target ketone to form Daphne Papitone A with a 43% yield. It is interesting to note that this reaction had been attempted by the Ney group, but they found that it resulted in over-reduction and the production of a dihydroxylated product. A closer examination of the experimental conditions reveals the reason for this difference in reactivity. When the Ney group carried out their reaction, they added the solid sodium borohydride directly to the solution of the substrate. When the Stoltz group carried out their loose reduction, they pre-prepared their solution of sodium borohydride and methanol and added an aliquot of this stock solution to the reaction mixture. By first preparing a methanolic solution of sodium borohydride, it allows for methanolysis to occur. This forms methoxyborohydrides, which are weaker reducing agents, and therefore are selective for the more reactive ketone. So now, let's move on to our final synthesis, which comes from the groups of Hui Lin Li and Xie Gong Shi. Their paper details two routes to Daphne Papitone A. Their first generation synthesis starts from the same R carvone as the previous two syntheses, and utilizes a similar strategy to form very similar intermediates. They first formed the intermediate, containing an aldehyde and an alkyne, and the aldehyde was then reacted with an organolithium reagent, forming a carbon-carbon bond and a hydroxyl group 
which was then protected as a TBDPS group. Deprotection of the THP group using tosic acid reveals a hydroxyl group that was then mesylated and reacted to form an allene. This reaction is an SN prime addition where the nucleophile attacks at the 3 position rather than the 1 position. The nucleophile in this case was a methyl organocopper reagent formed from methyl magnesium bromide, copper bromide and lithium bromide. This attacks the alkyne which triggers the elimination of the mesyl group forming the target allene in a 90% yield. As we saw with the Ne group, this intermediate could be subject to a Poisson and Canned reaction using a rhodium catalyst and the silyl group could then be deprotected using TBAF. The newly revealed hydroxyl group was then oxidized, in this case using a sworn oxidation rather than the DMP oxidation utilized by the Ne group. In this reaction, DMSO first attacks oxalyl chloride, eliminating an equivalent of chloride and forming a sulfur carbon bond. This chloride then comes back and acts as a nucleophile forming a chlorosulfonium reagent upon the elimination of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and chloride. The hydroxyl group of the starting material then attacks this chlorosulfonium reagent, eliminating the chloride and forming a sulfur-oxygen bond. This intermediate is then deprotonated by triethylamine and this then promotes the intramolecular abstraction of a hydrogen, eliminating dimethyl sulfide and forming the target oleodaphnone in an 81% yield. As we saw before, Photoradiation can promote a 2 plus 2 cyclodition of oleodaphnone to produce the cyclobutane ring, and the ketone was then reduced using Lusch conditions. This formed a hydroxyl group in a 63% yield with a greater than 20 to 1 DR, and it was then protected as an acetate group. With this protecting group in place, it could then carry out the allylic oxidation using chromium trioxide and dimethyl pyrazole. The DMP first coordinates to the chromium, and this complex then adds to the starting material, with the DMP acting as a base to deprotonate the allylic position, while the alpha position attacks the chromium to form a carbon-chromium bond. An intramolecular rearrangement then occurs, with an oxygen of the chromium complex attacking the allylic position and the carbon-chromium bond breaking to reform the enone. An intramolecular hydride abstraction can then occur, with the DMP once again acting as a base and the chromium complex being eliminated to form the target ketone in an 89% yield. With this ketone in place, it was then reduced using sodium borohydride and the newly produced hydroxyl group was then protected using TES chloride. This silyl group is orthogonal to the acetate protecting group which was already introduced and remained intact during the hydrolysis of this acetate group which was carried out using sodium hydroxide. This allowed for this position to be selectively oxidized using desmartin periodinane and deprotection of the TES group with HF yielded Daphne Papitone A with 17 steps in total. While the synthesis successfully produced the target compound, it is quite long and utilised many unnecessary protecting group manipulations. Taking what they learned from the first generation synthesis, they revised their strategy and developed a more concise route to the target that was very similar to the NA synthesis. They used the same indium promoted reaction to install the allene group and then carried out the pos and canned reaction and sworn oxidation in one pot to produce oleodaphnone. They then carried out the light promoted cycloaddition and directly added this solution to a reaction mixture of chromium trioxide and 3,5-DMP to carry out the allylic oxidation. Reducing this with sodium borohydride yielded Daphne Papitone A in a 75% yield in just 6 steps from R carvone without any protecting groups necessary. So with that, we come to the end of our exploration of the synthesis of Daphne Papitone A. We've seen how three different research groups can all arrive at similar synthetic strategies to produce this challenging natural product. It's shown how subtle differences such as how you add your reagents to reaction can have significant impacts on the success of the synthesis. We've also seen how you can often shorten the number of steps in your synthesis by simply telescoping your reactions together in one pot. Well I hope you enjoyed this video. In the next one we are going to look at the total synthesis of Saturn A.